Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm jean marc Lehman. Joining me today is Andrew Stevens, President and CEO of CNET Training, to talk us through the data center talent gap. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for talking to us. How serious is this current talent gap that we've got in the data center space? Um, uh, hi, I think, thank you. It's really serious. It really is a challenge. Um, it's something that we started talking about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and at the time, it was just, I think, largely thought of as a problem that would solve itself, um, but it hasn't, um, and it's getting getting worse. We've got an aging workforce um, that are all set to retire. We've got inflated salaries. We've got organizations trying to recruit from the same spaces, um, and no one is really looking at where the, the problem is. And the problem is we're an industry that's unknown, um, and everyone talks about this, but we've got to do something about it. So we've, we've got to get together um and try to uh, first of all understand the size of the problem i think hmm. how, how big would you say the problem is i mean do, do you have numbers um no it's very difficult it's very difficult to put numbers on but i mean if you you know you talk to any of the, the data center companies hmm. but but also the supply chain i mean this is something that we don't talk about you know the supply chain to these dc builds these dc moves um they're struggling and often the supply chain doesn't have the ability to pay the salaries that may be the sort of, let me call them the end user, because in this case, they are the, you know, they are the provider of the service and they are the ultimate employer. And so those, those companies in the supply chain just can't find the people either. So it is, it is, it is significant, it's affecting everybody. Um, and we're also, of course, in a, a particular period where other industries are suffering shortages as well. So, you know, where we're looking for these people, we're in a competitive place and we're in a competitive place with the organ with the industries that are well known and recognized, um, mm. you know, and the influence for choosing a career path or, or choosing an industry. Um, it starts very, very young, obviously, with your, you know, your parents, uh, close family, what they've all got involved in. And, um, you know, we have a pretty small community that that starts from. And uh, certainly we, we always smile and joke if you. You're at a dinner party and someone asks you what you do and you tell them you're in a, a data center industry, I you know, know the glaze over. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's really hard. It's really hard. We've got to come together as, as an industry. This is one of those topics where, similar to climate change, similar to sustainability, no organization can do this on their own. Um, mm -hmm. And we've really, really got to be effective and focus on how we solve the problem. Um, and not focus too heavily on trying to solve it now uh, in, in the immediacy because we can't solve the immediate problem. We're going to have to work through it and build a talent pipeline that has to go back to you know school. And we've got to engage with schools. We've got to have correct programs to attract people to this industry. Hmm. That, that, that's very interesting. I mean, you, you brought up quite a lot of different topics, there, especially the holistic view, um, not just within the data center, but bringing the other industries that are related to the data center, the indirect industry that work with us, the supply chain especially, um, I think they came to light even more during COVID. Um, and we're seeing some crisis in other industries now, especially in the UK, you've got a London background, so you'll know well um, the energy crisis because of the truck drivers. Um, I mean, it's it's a very interesting era, but it's interesting that you also say that we need to prepare the future generations to so go back to school um, and start with children. Um, is CNET doing anything around that or is CNET more focused on the university level? Um, no, no, I mean, we, 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 we do believe that you've got to really get involved at, at the school level. Um, we've been one of the driving forces behind the um, opening of the first university technical college here in the UK. It's going to be based down at Heathrow, um, and its main topic is data centre engineering. Um, now, that addresses um, children from the ages of 14 through to 18, mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's some pathways therefore open to them. But in fact, we've got to go further back. We've got to really start to get um, children um, to understand STEM. Because ultimately, you know, we're a STEM industry. So we've really got to encourage STEM. And of course, this then links in really closely with the diversity in all, in all factors. Because if we get the STEM message right in at schools um, where they might be deprived areas, not just the, you know, not just the hubs, um, we can start to really address the diversity issue as well. So all of the members of staff at, um, at CNET are STEM ambassadors. Um, we give them a number of days a year, a sort of additional time off to go and work in schools and colleges, um, just to promote the industry. Now, clearly, we don't want to be going in there and starting to talk technical or trying to overdo it. But what we've actually got to do is just highlight 
that their digital life mm -hmm. is run on the platforms that they could become involved in in the future to shape and develop and work. And, and it's quite exciting. So you have to obviously get the message correct, but you've got to make it interesting enough to draw those individuals into thinking STEM technology, internet, you know, those kind of things. And then this is where it all runs. And, and hopefully we can attract people. Um, of course, we've got to stop talking about just the engineering elements as well. Because yeah. that's one of the areas, because there's a huge numbers of jobs in sales, marketing, HR, finance that are involved in the data center industry as well. Um, and therefore, we've got to highlight those. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a broad brush, but we've got to do it together. And we've got to encourage um, the trade associations, for example, around the world, really to come together and start to have a sort of a, a global approach to this is the messages we want to get across. Let's all do our bit. And then we can start to influence it over a period. But, but it's going to take 10 years. It's going to take 10 years, if not a bit longer, to really start to make a meaningful difference. And we've got a lot of work to do in the meantime. Um, obviously, you know, you asked the question as to what else we're doing. Um, we've been working with the military resettlement um, uh, market for the last 25 years since we started out. And... You know, we have to work with the military. The military in the UK in particular has a different approach now to its resettlement. Previously, it was a bit of a sort of a scenario where if you decided to leave the military, you weren't treated um, you know, favorably. Um, now the military has seen that really what they're trying to do from the beginning of a military career is explain to um, individuals that they will ultimately have two careers. They will have their military career and then they will have their uh, civilian career. And what we need to be doing is helping them during their military career to get the qualifications, to undertake the programs, um, maybe to do some work placement and all of those kinds of things to start to build an, another pipeline. You know, the military won't solve the problem on its own, but it's one of those many. It helps a little bit. Sorry, I was just saying it helps a little bit. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Yes, no, no, and it, it does help a little bit. And of course, you're bringing military personnel in that have maybe already trained and operated. So the Royal Signals, for example, in the UK, you know, many of them have worked on uh, data centres that maybe look a bit different to what we see in and around London and Slough, um, but they're still functionally the same type of beast. And, and those individuals. So we've got to look at that. Then we've got to look at um, you know alternative industries. But we've got to look at broader than alternative industries. We've got to get our teams and our people to really understand what transferable skills means. Um, one of the challenges I've had over the last 25 years is that in academia, in education, you know, there is a whole language that many people outside of that don't understand. No difference to the data center. We have our own language, we have our own acronyms. Um, but people have sometimes forgotten their own educational path and what that, that means and, you know, what a bachelor's degree actually means. And then where can you see in apprenticeships or as I prefer to call them career ships, how can that fit into what we're doing and start to not look for DC skills. Um, I think I've, I've said many times is, you know, I get so frustrated when I see a job advert um, for a data center technician um, that requires a bachelor's degree or five years experience. Um, you know, if we keep on asking those questions, we're not going to fill the gaps because you know, an engine, someone with great engineering skills um, you know, can easily work in a data center with some assistance. You know, you can't leave them on their own, but we certainly can put the things in place to transfer people over relatively quickly. Um, and, but also, let's not, in our industry, um, over egg it. Let's not try to say we need people with certain skills when we don't. Let's understand what skills we need and you know the, the appropriate skills and be able to find ways to identify those as well i mean that, that that's very interesting and um i guess um bringing thinking outside the box as well into the data center space especially such a pivotal moment that we are in uh, with all the new technologies and how we're building data centers lately um and i mean even with covid the the, the whole different kind of marketing campaigns we're going to put together um i guess the industry can really benefit from bringing people from outside the industry um, into our sector uh, with, uh, with transferable skills to really help build the brand into the next stage. In terms of um, addressing the skills gap, we do focus very, in, 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 you know, for the conversation we have here about what can we do, we are focusing a lot of our efforts on, on the UK market. 
because every country has its own educational system, has different ways of funding that educational system, um, different ages for transferring between um, colleges and schools, etc. So we do focus on that. However, one of the things we do think is that things like the content or curriculum that we would be using in the university technical college you know we should make that freely available to other colleges other schools and really have that out there so that people can use the same information use the same templates so we can start to get the message across and you know we have started to work with with iMasons um, quite a lot and obviously they're offering scholarships to people coming in from other industries so that's proving to be very very effective um, and they're certainly putting a lot of work into to making that happen and of course they're also helping address the diversity issue with the way in which they're offering those scholarships so we can we can and we do do bits and pieces around the world but obviously we're trying to focus that particular core element um, in the UK. Okay, uh, and you've said this is going to be a 10 year journey. What do you envision um, in 10 years time did that is in the space to be like? Well, um, it'll be, you know, more automated. Um, I think it will have um, calmed down in terms of our own self belief. I think there is a bit too much within our industry of saying how good we are, and how difficult it is to get people and those kind of things. So I think if, if I were to phrase it, I think it will normalize over a period, yes, there'll be growth. Yes, there'll still be demand. But I think technology will assist in, in that. But I also do believe that um, we will start to see students coming into the industry because I think the industry is now beginning to be recognized. People are talking about it. Um, as, as terrible as COVID has been, it certainly has highlighted um, in some areas um, not the data center industry, but the technology that sits in the data center industry, you know, Zoom and Teams and all those things. And you know, people have, have experienced different things now. They still don't know how it works um, and they may forget it. So it is our job just to keep the message going. But I think it will normalize. I think it will become more of a traditional industry. I think there will be apprenticeships and career ships that come into place. And I think some of the universities and colleges will stop just teaching IT in those cases. They will broaden this out and the smart building revolution as well, I think will assist in, you know, what is a smart building? Is a data center a smart building? Or is an office block a smart building? Or actually are there similar technologies, just slightly different purposes? So I think that's what will happen over the next 10 years. Um, but I think we will always be facing a bit of a skills crisis um, because I think that's a macroeconomic issue. I think it's a global, issue um, and I think that one of the areas of, of, of difficulty is largely the funding of FE colleges and, and how those are put together because it makes it very difficult for further education and higher education establishments um, and schools and colleges to be able to fund the development of curriculum and keep it up to date and keep it changing. That is one of their biggest challenges. And I think um, we, again, as an industry, have got to look at how can we provide that curriculum across all those areas and keep it fresh and keep it moving. Would you like to see the government more involved in that? Because um, I guess they are backing some of the STEM subjects, but would you like to see something a bit more niche into certain industries, not even just data centers, but would you like to see the government more involved? Um, I think so. I think um, government you know, does need to be more involved. And I think government has to start to really listen to industry sectors as about what, what they require. Um, certainly, you know, here in the UK, um, education policy over the last 25 years has changed, you know, numerous times um, and sometimes, you know, a complete 180 degree turnaround. However, I think here in the UK now with the um, development of apprenticeships um, and the new way in which they are delivered, um, as I said, I would prefer to them to be called career ships because now in the UK, Anybody of any age can undertake an apprenticeship and it is either nearly fully funded by government or funded by a, a levy, which large organisations are uh, have to pay regardless. And they have an account that they create and the money goes into that. So I think organisations as well have got to come closer to government and have got to start to learn a little bit more about the system that provides them the people. Um, often when I go in and talk into executives, as I, as I alluded to, now, I'm talking about level five apprenticeships, uh, level six apprenticeships, and, and they're looking at me blankly thinking, I've no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, can you explain it to me? And of course, I, I do explain it to them, but then they've got to go off and explain it to their teams and you get Chinese whispers. And, and by the time you sort of 
you get round to the, the final conversation with people, it appears to have become complicated, you know. And so that's one of the things I think we've got to do is try and bring this message together that, you know, everybody that um, comes into this industry will have passed through academia, will have gone through the education system. So as employers, we've got to understand what that ed education system can offer to us. And we've got to work closer with the colleges and, and, and the schools that are you know, in your in your area and, and try to engage. I, I personally think that you know, there should be, you know, a school's engagement officer or college engagement officer. Their job is purely to keep those local schools and colleges engaged with the industry. And I think that would be exciting and have somebody within the organisation as well that other people can go to and say to, you know, explain apprenticeships to me. Tell me about FE colleges because... It, it, it is it is difficult to, to to sort of understand the whole process and what, what organizations can and can't do. Hmm. That's just, I like the idea of the chief engagement officer. Um, but um, Andrew, some people still say that we don't need to educate people outside the industry about our industry, uh, which consequently would then bring people to work with us. Um, and some people also say that in a few years time, in a few decades, we won't even need humans working in the data center because there'll be AI. Um, just quickly, what would you have to say about those two things um, to people that say uh, that? I, I think predictions along those lines are incredibly dangerous. Um, you know, only two years ago or 18 months ago, there were many, many people saying the office is dead. No one's ever going to return to an office ever again. Let's rip them all down. Well, you know, 18 months on, people are returning to the office. Um, I think AI, you know, will obviously have an impact, um, but data centers are growing. There are more of them. There are still an awful lot of legacy and enterprise data centers out there. There are clients that are moving out of Colo back to their own facilities. Um, there's all sorts of change. So I think, um, you know, 25 years from now, you know, really who knows? But, you know, AI is not going to remove the human from the data center on a global scale anytime, anytime soon. Um, things will change, but then there'll be other roles, other deployments. Um, you, know, you may refer to it as sort of the hollowing out effect. You know, there may be some roles that are replaced. But certainly with the, the skills crisis that we've got, those people will just be moving into slightly different roles. And, and who knows what the next edge is going to do? Who knows what the impact of you know, local deployment and when new technology comes along? So I think you know, it's a long, way, well, a long way away before we don't have humans in, in, in the data centers at, you know, in scale. All right, we've got time. And Andrew, if people want to find out more about CNET, uh, where can they go and how can they get in touch with you? Um, our website, which is cnet-training.com, is probably the best place to go. We have all of the information about individual courses and programs and schedules and detailed um, program overviews, um, but also follow us on, on Twitter um, and, and obviously find us on LinkedIn as well. All right. Great place to, to be. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you, our viewers as well, for tuning into JSA TV and JSA Podcasts. And don't forget to check our social media channels for more content. Until next time, happy networking. Thank you.